Chapter Seven of Clotel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clotel by William Wells Brown. Chapter Seven, The Poor Whites South. No seeming of logic can ever convince the American people that thousands of our slaveholding brethren are not excellent, humane, and even Christian men fearing God and keeping his commandments. Rev. Dr. Joel Parker "'You like these parts better than New York?' said Carlton to Snyder, as they were sitting down to dinner in the overseer's dwelling. "'I can't say that I do,' was the reply. "'I came here ten years ago as missionary, and Mr. Peck wanted me to stay, and I have remained. I travel among the poor whites during the week, and preach for the niggers on Sunday. Are there many poor whites in this district?' not here but about thirty miles from here in the sand hill district they are as ignorant as horses why it was no longer than last week i was up there and really you would not believe it that people were so poor off in new england and i may say in all the free states they have free schools and everybody gets educated not so here in connecticut there is only one out of every five hundred above twenty-one years that can neither read nor write here there is one out of every eight that can neither read nor write there is not a single newspaper taken in five of the counties in this state last week i was at sand hill for the first time and i called at a farmhouse the man was out it was a low log hut and yet it was the best house in that locality the woman and nine children were there and the geese ducks chickens pigs and children were all running about the floor the woman seemed scared at me when I entered the house. I inquired if I could get a little dinner and my horse fed. She said yes, if I would only be good enough to feed him myself, as her gal, as she called her daughter, would be afraid of the horse. When I returned into the house again from the stable, she kept her eyes upon me all the time. At last she said, I suppose you ain't never been in these parts afore. No, said I. Is you going to stay here long? not very long i replied on business i suppose yes said i i am hunting up the lost sheep of the house of israel oh exclaimed she hunting for lost sheep is you well you have a hard time to find em here my husband lost an old ram last week and he ain't found em yet and he's hunted every day i am not looking for four-legged sheep said i i am hunting for sinners ah she said then you are a preacher Yes, said I. You are the first of that sort that's been in these diggings for many a day. Turning to her eldest daughter, she said in an excited tone, Clear out the pigs and ducks and sweep up the floor. This is a preacher. And it was some time before any of the children would come near me. One remained under the bed, which, by the by, was in the same room, all the while I was there. Well, continued the woman, I was a-tellin' my man only yesterday that I would like once more to go to meetin' before I died, and he said as he should like to do the same. But as you have come, it will save us the trouble of going out of the district. Then you found some of the lost sheep, said Carlton. Yes, replied Snyder. I did not find anything else up there. The state makes no provision for educating the poor. They are unable to do it themselves, and they grow up in a state of ignorance and degradation. The men hunt, and the women have to go in the fields and labor. "'What is the cause of it?' inquired Carlton. "'Slavery,' answered Snyder. "'Slavery and nothing else. Look at the city of Boston. It pays more taxes for the support of the government than this entire state. The people of Boston do more business than the whole population of Mississippi put together. I was told some very amusing things while at Sand Hill. A farmer there told me a story about an old woman— who was very pious herself. She had a husband and three sons, who were sad characters, and she had often prayed for their conversion, but to no effect. At last, one day, while working in the cornfield, one of her sons was bitten by a rattlesnake. He had scarce reached home before he felt the poison, and in his agony called loudly on his maker. The pious old woman, when she heard this, forgetful of her son's misery and everything else but the glorious hope of his repentance, fell on her knees and prayed as follows. 
O Lord, I thank thee that thou hast at last opened Jimmy's eyes to the error of his ways, and I pray that, in thy divine mercy, thou wilt send a rattlesnake to bite the old man, and another to bite Tom, and another to bite Harry, for I am certain that nothing but a rattlesnake, or something of that kind, will ever turn them from their sinful ways. They are so hard-headed. When returning home, and before I got out of the Sand Hill district, I saw a funeral, and thought I would fasten my horse to a post and attend. The coffin was carried in a common horse-cart, and followed by fifteen or twenty persons very shabbily dressed, and attended by a man whom I took to be the religious man of the place. After the coffin had been placed near the grave, he spoke as follows. Friends and neighbors, you have congregated to see this lump of mortality put into a hole in the ground. You all know the deceased, a worthless, drunken, good-for-nothing vagabond. He lived in disgrace and infamy, and died in wretchedness. You all despised him. You all know his brother Joe, who lives on the hill. He's not a bit better, though he has scraped together a little property by cheating his neighbors. His end will be like that of this loathsome creature, whom you will please put into the hole as soon as possible. I won't ask you to drop a tear, but Brother Bohow will please raise a hymn while we fill up the grave. I am rather surprised to hear that any portion of the whites in this state are in so low a condition. Yes, it is true, replied Snyder. These are very unpleasant facts to be related to ye, Mr. Carlton, said Huckleby. But I can bear witness to what Mr. Snyder has told ye. Huckleby was from Maryland, where many of the poor whites are in as sad a condition as the sand hillers of Mississippi. He was a tall man, of iron constitution, and could neither read nor write, but was considered one of the best overseers in the country. When about to break a slave in, to do a heavy task, he would make him work by his side all day, and if the new hand kept up with him, he was set down as an able-bodied man. Huckleby had neither moral, religious, or political principles, and often boasted that conscience was a matter that never cost him a thought. "'Mr. Snyder ain't told ye half about the folks in these parts,' continued he. "'We who comes from more enlightened parts don't know how to put up with them down there. I find the people here knows mighty little indeed. In fact, I may say that they are universally uneducated. I goes out among none of them, cause they ain't such as I have been used to associate with. When I gets a little richer so that I can stop work, I tend to go back to Maryland and spend the rest of my days. I wonder the Negroes don't attempt to get their freedom by physical force. It ain't no use for em to try that, for if they do we puts em through by daylight, replied Huckleby. There are some desperate fellows among the slaves, said Snyder. Indeed, remarked Carlton. Oh, yes, replied the preacher. A case has just taken place near here, where a neighbor of ours, Mr. J. Higgerson, attempted to correct a negro man in his employ, who resisted, drew a knife, and stabbed him, Mr. H., in several places. Mr. J. C. Hobbs, a Tennessean, ran to his assistance. Mr. Hobbs stooped to pick up a stick to strike the negro, and while in that position the negro rushed upon him and caused his immediate death. The negro then fled to the woods, but was pursued with the dogs, and soon overtaken. He had stopped in a swamp to fight the dogs, when the party who were pursuing him came up upon him and commanded him to give up, which he refused to do. He then made several efforts to stab them. Mr. Robertson, one of the party, gave him several blows on the head with a rifle gun. But this, instead of subduing, only increased his desperate revenge. Mr. R. then discharged his gun at the negro, and missing him, the ball struck Mr. Boone in the face and felled him to the ground. The negro, seeing Mr. Boone prostrated, attempted to rush up and stab him, but was prevented by the timely interference of some one of the party. He was then shot three times with a revolving pistol, and once with a rifle, and after having his throat cut, he still kept the knife firmly grasped in his hand, and tried to cut their legs when they approached to put an end to his life. This chastisement was given because the negro grumbled, and found fault with his master for flogging his wife. Well, this is a bad state of affairs indeed, and especially the condition of the poor whites, said Carlton. You see, replied Snyder, no white man is respectable in these slave states who works for a living. No community can be prosperous where honest labor is not honored. No society can be rightly constituted where the intellect is not fed. 
whatever institution reflects discredit on industry, whatever institution forbids the general culture of the understanding, is palpably hostile to individual rights and to social well-being. Slavery is the incubus that hangs over the southern states. Yes, interrupted Huckleby, them's just my sentiments now and no mistake. I think that for the honor of our country, this slavery business should stop. I don't own any, no how, and I would not be an overseer if I weren't paid for it. End of chapter 7